Hi there, this is Emma from Beanbag Books. I know it's been a minute, but when every single day feels like a Monday, uh, just on a big loop, then it's kind of hard to figure out when you're going to film. But before I completely forget everything I read in February, I just thought I would do a quick book wrap up, at least as quick as I can manage because somehow in 28 days I read six books. That hasn't happened to me in a long time in February. Usually in February I'm staggering under the weight of my schoolwork and kind of want to die. <laughs> so six books in February is actually pretty good for me. First book is Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons. Give me a second to remember what it's about because I read this a month ago. I've slept since then. Okay, okay, so what happens is the protagonist is named Flora. She's sort of like an upper-class-ish young British girl in, I think, the 1930s. That's about when this is set. And her parents die suddenly, and she realizes that there is no money for her to live off of, and she also has not been educated in the proper direction to do something practical. I feel so attacked right now. So she ends up at the house of her cousins, which is called Cold Comfort Farm. She's never met these cousins. She really doesn't know a whole lot about them. And when she gets there, she realizes that they're a little bit cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. They're very eccentric. They have their own way of doing things. All of them have sort of their own things that they're into. Um, there's one cousin who's super into the movies to the exclusion of basically anything else. He says that he's tried to take out girls, but when he takes them to the movies, they, they keep wanting to do things like, I don't know, talk to him, and he just wants to watch the movie, and so, mm -mm, he doesn't want to do no girls. And then there's one cousin who's kind of Anne of Green Gables gone wild. She's always, like, wandering about the farm with her hair a mess trailing behind her, and thinking up these wild, fantastical adventures and things like that. And Flora is like, I am gonna take this family and I am gonna get them in shape. And so that's pretty much what the book is about. So everybody has told me that this book is super funny. Like, for a long time, it was the only funny book by a woman that anybody would really admit was funny. So that's part of why I was excited to read it. However, it took me a really long time to get into the book, partly because the humor, although it is really hilarious once you figure out how it works, it's, it's very subtle and understated, and sometimes it takes a minute to sort of be like, oh, that was a joke. Maybe I'm just dense. That's entirely possible. Also, I just really didn't know what to make of Flora. She, I feel like she was intended to be this like really take charge, like feminist sort of character, but she reads a little bit different in 2021. She comes off as kind of elitist. She is convinced that she's better than her cousins because she had more money and was better educated. And so a lot of the book is her trying to like reform them and teach them manners. And also the things have a way of working out for her like really unrealistically well. But something I kind of decided over the course of reading the book was I think that's just kind of how it is. This, this is a satire. It's kind of like a silly fun story. You don't need to take it really seriously. And once I started reading it like that, then I realized that the narrative was poking a little bit of fun of Flo at Flora as well, even though things generally do work out her way. And so I started to enjoy it more. The writing is really great. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is, you know how dreadful intelligent people are when you take them to dances. Very true. <laughs> I ended up enjoying this book even though it took a while to get into. I'd give it probably a three and a half out of five. So good, and I'd be willing to check out other books by the author. Next up, we have The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Skloot. This book, if you somehow haven't heard of it, is about the story of a Black woman, a Black working class woman in the 1950s named Henrietta Lacks, who was diagnosed with cancer and died soon after, but doctors realized that the cancer cells that she had inside of her were growing at an alarming rate and even when they were like taken out of her body they still continued to grow which is incredibly unusual and so her cancer cells began to be used to develop different kinds of medicines and different vaccines and although um, a lot of people like made a lot of money off of her cells none of that money was given to her family 
who continued to live in poverty for several decades and couldn't afford their own health insurance. And Rebecca Skloot is a science journalist who in who had always been interested in the story since she learned about it in school and in the early 2000s decided to write a book about it. So this book was a little bit different than what I thought I was going to get. I expected more of the story of Henrietta herself, but it's a very big picture sort of thing. Henrietta is barely in the book at all, and honestly, I did not get a very good impression of who she was from the book. But that it's possibly because most of her family who's still alive either don't remember her or didn't really want to talk to Rebecca Skloot about it they did, um, because it took them a very long time to trust her. What I did get from this book that I appreciated was a really thorough and nuanced discussion of using people's like cells and tissues to develop different medicines and also like other organs that they have and whether those people should receive compensation for it. The author presents different sides of the argument and sort of explains why each of them can kind of be seen as valid in different ways and she also uses the story of Henrietta's family to show some of like the negative effects of the systemic factors that often led to black people being mistreated by doctors. I was interested in Henrietta's family, so I ended up not being too disappointed that Henrietta herself is not a huge character in this. The one thing that kind of holds me back from um, really recommending this book is I feel like the author, Rebecca Skloot, who's a white woman, she's extremely present in the story to a degree that I was kind of uncomfortable with at some points. I'm sure her intentions were good. It seems like she really did want to just do the, do the research and give whatever um, comfort to the family that she could in like helping them figure out what happened to their mother. But she shows up in the book a lot and oftentimes in the scenes where we're with Henrietta's family we see everything sort of filtered through her perspective of them. And though I'm sure she didn't mean anything untoward, I couldn't help but be aware that that was the case. Now this book came out in about 2010, I think. And even in 11 years, the world has changed quite a bit. And I think if this book were trying, to, if someone were trying to write this book now, it would probably be thought about very differently. Probably maybe people would consider getting a black reporter, hopefully, to help tell the story. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to shake the idea that this is sort of a white reporter telling the story of black people. I did read a little bit about Rebecca Skloot's decision to include herself in the story. She thought it would be kind of disingenuous not to do so. And that helped me understand why she did it, but I still have reservations about why she did it. I do think this book is well written and gives a good overview of issues relating to the tissue industry. So I would still give it like a three and a half out of five. Okay, next book is Lost Roses by Martha Hall Kelly. This is a historical fiction novel set during the Russian Revolution, and it centers on three women. One is American and two are Russian, and of the two Russian women, one is an aristocrat and one is a commoner. And it tells the story of how like these three women um, intersect and how they're all like trying to navigate this situation that the world is in and also how it affects their personal lives. I'm gonna have to put a trigger warning over this one. There is some discussion of sexual assault and violence. This is a war situation and we definitely are not permitted to forget that. So just letting you know. So I'm sorry to say that though this book started off okay, it ended up kind of sad trombone. I don't know, I don't know how this happened, but of, the, of our three main narrators, I could never care about all three of them at the same time. I think Eliza, the American woman, took a while for me to warm up to because she's just sort of, I don't know, chilling in the US and she has quite a bit of money and she's all like, oh, I have to decorate my house. My husband, he wants to buy this house and I don't know if I want to. And I'm just like, girl, we just left Varenka, like, in a horrible living situation in a soon-to-be war-torn country and now you're expecting us to be upset about your house. Varenka, for a long time, who's the, the Russian commoner girl, she was probably one of my favorite characters. She's in a really awful, abusive home situation and I really sympathized with her because of that and I thought that her desire to get a, get a job and become independent was, it made a lot of sense. But unfortunately, later in the book, she just starts to make these 
stupid, stupid decisions that don't make any sense. They're basically just there for plot reasons and it really stopped me from caring about her character and that made me upset because I had liked her so much in the earlier parts of the book. Sophia, who's the Russian aristocrat narrator, for a long time I had a, I had a difficult time telling her and Eliza apart, <laughs> so it was difficult for me to specifically sympathize with her, but later in the story she became a lot better. But even so, I still took so long to connect with her that I felt like the book was just really disjointed. I also felt like we got a lot of the aristocrat side of the story and not so much the like the revolutionaries and it would have been interesting to see a little bit more of them. We did get a little bit but I would have liked to dig into that a little bit more. Also I just didn't like the writing in this book like at all. The dialogue was often really clunky and I felt like the author fell into the trap of a lot of historical fiction novels where they're trying to create this picture for you of what that time was like and so they start having the characters minutely describe every single thing that they're wearing, uh, which no actual person would have done at that time so it's extremely jarring to hear Sophia talk about like putting her corset on and what that entails. It's kind of like if I wrote a book and my character was like this is how you put on a bra. So overall, unfortunately, I can't really justify giving this book more than two stars. I enjoyed it in the beginning and the middle, but the end just sort of took a nosedive and I also had too many other problems with the story anyway to really recommend it to anybody. Next up we have The Posthumous Memoirs of Bras Cubas by Machado de Assis who is a well-known Brazilian writer, at least he was, he wrote in the late 1800s, and the book was translated by Flora Thompson Vero. So Machado de Assis is so well-known in Brazil that it's really interesting that he's not as well-known in other parts of the world. We mostly, I think, from Brazil know about Clarice Lispector and... who's that guy who wrote The Alchemist? Oh, I can't remember. I didn't really like The Alchemist. Oh! Paulo Coelho. Yeah, that guy. This may or may not have something to do with the fact that Machado de Assis was of mixed race. He was the grandson of former slaves, I believe, and though he was uneducated as a, as a child, he was able to rise into a very influential and powerful literary career, and he was well, well respected in his lifetime. This is what a lot of people consider to be his best work, and the premise is pretty awesome. It's a dead man currently moldering inside the earth telling the story of his life as a dead dude. Well, that's actually pretty cool in postmodern, especially given the time period. And the, the book as a whole is really kooky and weird and it's got a lot of philosophical references. My head was kind of spinning, but in a good way. It was like a good spinning. It's like when you're on the teacups at the Mad Tea Party at Disney World and you're not quite going fast enough that you want to be sick, but you're going fast enough that you're like, this is good. This was a good move. I do, however, have one caveat about this book. Your enjoyment of it is primarily going to be based on how charmed you are by Bras Cubas. And let's say I was insufficiently charmed. Bras Cubas is a really funny character and I mostly enjoyed the way that he talks about his life. He's very witty, but he's also very self-centered and there were all these other characters moving around throughout the narrative and I wanted to know more about them, but he just wasn't interested in giving me that information. And I just got really tired of it. I wanted to hear more about, I don't know, another human besides him. And I understand that is some of the point of the novel, but when you get so irritated by it that it hinders your enjoyment of the novel, I think that that is a valid criticism. And it's the one that I have. I do get, though, that this is a matter of personal preference on my part, and I don't want to discourage anybody from reading the book who might enjoy it. I would give it probably a three and a half star rating overall, so I did still like it. And the translation that I read, which was published last year by Flora Thompson Vero, is a really excellent English translation. It reads very, very well. It evokes the style of the time period. I don't know much about the style of Machado de Assis, but overall I really liked how it was translated. And also she does a really good job of adding in footnotes to references that English speakers of today might not understand. And since a lot of this book has to do with some of the inner workings of Brazilian society at the time, that was super helpful. Next up, we have All-American Muslim Girl by Nadine Jolie Courtney. 
Uh, this is a young adult novel about Ali Abraham, who's a teenage Muslim girl. Her father's family is Muslim. He uh, immigrated to the United States as a young man for college and then met her mother. Her mother converted to Islam, but her family doesn't really practice Islam. And Ali is pretty fair skinned and can pass as white. So most of her friends don't even know that she is Muslim. However, she's just moved to a new state and she is in the process of trying to learn a little bit more about Islam and what the faith is like. And she becomes really interested, interested in it and she wants to explore it more. But then she finds out that the cool guy that she's dating, Wells, his dad is this like Rush Limbaugh-like figure who is known for spouting bigotry, especially Islamophobia, and has made his money off of that. And then on top of all of this, her dad is really not into the fact that she wants to explore Islam further. He left the religion entirely and he doesn't want her to have anything to do with it. And so that's also a huge conflict here. I'm not Muslim and I don't know a whole lot about Islam, so I can't really judge whether this book represented the religion and the, and the culture accurately. But what I can say is that as a person of faith, myself, I really felt like Allie's decisions to learn more about the faith and the struggles she had trying to figure out how to navigate that were really well done. I've wished for a while that there were more books about people who decide to explore their faith tradition more rather than just like leaving it. And I think that other readers who are religious or spiritual deserve to see themselves in books. You know, books that aren't like 200 years old or feature characters who are people of faith but they're homophobic or anti-feminist or racist or something like that. Ali has these uh, Quran studies with a new friend she makes at school and the discussions that they have I think were really realistic and spoke to my experience of having discussions about the Bible with friends. And it was really interesting to see like the Muslim side of that. I thought Ali and her boyfriend and her parents were all really well-rounded characters. I love YA books where the parents get to be like actual characters instead of just like these background people. And both of her parents had very different relationships with faith and how they decided to approach it. And I thought that was really well explored. The main real complaint I have about this book is that most of the other characters, including a lot of her school friends, were kind of like talking heads for specific points in a lot of ways. And that could sometimes make the writing feel a bit heavy handed. But that was honestly rare. I still really enjoyed this book. Would give it four out of five. It was good. Next up, we have the one, the only, Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. I had heard a lot of good things about this book from booktube and from reviews that I read. I was looking for a new kind of epic style fantasy, but with good characters, some of whom are women, you know? <laughs> I enjoyed it from the beginning. It took me a while to really sink my teeth into the world and the characters, but I, I feel like that was intentional. I feel like sort of the slow build of this was what the author was going for. And once I was into it, I was so into it. I was listening to, I, I listened to it on audiobook. I was listening to it every chance I got. I was listening to it while I was cooking. I was listening to it when I was on walks. I, at one point, about 80% of the way through this book, was wandering around my neighborhood with tears in my eyes and walked in circles about three or four times. And I was wondering if somebody was gonna ask me if I was okay. I wasn't, but it's fine. <laughs> This is a fantasy that's based on pre-Columbian societies, and it's really nice to see an epic fantasy that isn't based off of just like kind of white medieval-ish Europe. I loved all the details about the different festivals, the clothing that the different groups of people wear, the religious entities that different groups worship. It was very anthropological in that way, and I think that that was pretty cool. There's also a little quote at the beginning of each chapter that are like historical texts from these societies. And I think that really helped enhance the verisimilitude of the story. There are four main narrators. The fourth doesn't come in until late in the book. And once you get to that narrator, it's really cool. It's kind of like unlocking a secret door in a video game or something. You're just like, oh, new narrator. I thought the relationships between these characters was super well done. And especially there were these two characters that get together 
kind of partway through the book, also kind of not, but I was really rooting for them to get together. That may or may not have been the source of the wandering and crying. But it's fine. Really, really, it's fine. The writing is also great. It's propulsive. It pushes you along, but it's also in a lot of ways very beautiful, which is difficult to do. So <clears throat> even though it took me a little bit to get into this book, I listened to it on audiobook, as I said, and I think that that might not have been the best choice for me personally, not because the narrators were not good, but because there was just so much information being thrown at me at once and my brain just couldn't catch it in an auditory setting. That might have been why it took me a while to get into it, but I still really, really loved it. I did. I loved it. Five stars. I can't wait for the next book. Oh, by the way, the narrators were named Kara G or Guy, I'm not sure, Nicole Lewis, Kaipo Schwab, and Sean Taylor Corbett, and they were all great. Loved their performances. So that was my quick whirlwind book wrap up to sort of get myself back on track with these videos. Next week I will hopefully actually upload something. Um, I have a couple of ideas, won't spoil anything yet, but in the meantime I hope you all have a good week, whoever's watching, and hopefully you'll see me in a little bit. Bye!